I'm Kathy McGrade. I have a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which I got in 1979. I then spent the next 30 years uh, with three startup companies. The first one was uh, named Starstruck, and we built a rocket for a rocket system for delivering satellites to low Earth orbit in competition with the space shuttle, Ariane Spas, other government-funded uh, launch systems. The second was named Metcal, and in that company we melded together two different uh, rather obscure material properties to make, uh, to make a heating device that would self-regulate the temperature without having a thermocouple feedback loop. It's self-regulated as a matter of the material property itself. The third company was named Crystalloom, and there we used chemical vapor deposition. Uh, we applied that to methane gas, broke open the methane molecule, and deposited diamond down as an, engineer, as an engineering material, thin film diamond. Then after those three startups, I did my own company, which is fail-safe testing. That's what I'm still doing. Uh, I took a non-destructive testing technique called acoustic emission, and I applied it to fire service aerials to determine the structural integrity, to evaluate the structural integrity of their aerial ladders. The way I got into 9-11, doing 9-11 research, was when a friend asked me if fire can melt steel. And, they, and he was referring to 9-11, asking, can office fires melt steel? And no, it can't. Not an office fire. A blast furnace can melt steel because you're driving lots of oxygen into a closed furnace where you're capturing the heat and driving oxygen in. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the, the, the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. And the more and more I looked into it, the more I was horrified by what I saw. One thing I would like people to know is that you don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. I'm asked all the time, why should we not believe the experts and what they've told us? And I always answer with this simple story. One day when I was driving my truck down the road, my truck quit suddenly. And as I was waiting for the tow truck to come, I thought to myself, well, don't just sit here like a stool pigeon. You know, get out of your truck, open the hood, and look underneath the hood for anything that's obviously broken. And I did that, and I checked everything. I checked the oil, I checked the oil temperature, I looked for, you know, fan belt broken, anything, obvious things. Nothing was wrong. But when the mechanic called me and told me that I needed a new engine because it had overheated and because it had dropped its oil and overheated, I knew he was lying because I had opened the hood and looked for myself and thought for myself. And it turned out it was just a cam sensor and I was able to fix it myself. I was able to get the part on eBay and stick it on and watch a YouTube on how to fix it and stick it on and drive away. But the comparison is this. Unless you're willing, we all have to be willing to look at the videos of the buildings coming down. You have to be willing to look for the obvious evidence. And you don't have to be a mechanic, an engineer, an architect to see if it makes sense or not, if what you're, to see how those buildings fall. And then you have to be willing to listen to the expert or you have to be willing to say to that expert who tells you, here's what happened, no, you're lying. I know that's not true. I know that's not true because I watched the video and I saw the buildings come down. It's obvious because of the symmetry. The symmetry is the smoking gun. Those buildings could not have fallen in perfectly level. It's as if you take a, a, a level 
with a bubble in the center and watch those buildings come down and that bubble will stay centered the whole way down. And that cannot happen with an airplane hitting one side of the building. It cannot happen that when you have asymmetric damage, you will get a perfectly symmetrical collapse. And all you need to do is look at the videos and see that. Then you have to be willing to trust what you saw and call out the lie. When you look at the evidence of 9-11, there is a, there is a preponderance of evidence. But I believe there are three smoking guns. And one of them is the microspheres that were found in three different samples from three independent research researchers. The um, R.J. Lee Company, the USGS, and Dr. Stephen Jones's work. All three separately found these microspheres. They're perfectly round. You cannot get a perfectly round sphere of metal from the building tearing apart. The only way you can get that is by starting with a molten, a molten liquid. A liquid will create the perfectly round sphere as it solidifies. There's no other way you could get that. That's one of the smoking guns. The other, I think, is David Chandler's work, which is excellent, the two and a quarter second of free fall in Building 7. And then the third one is, uh, it is very well explained in the article, The Missing Jolt. And that explains how in the Twin Towers, there simply was not evidence of work being done. No work was done to collapse the building below. I think those are the three smoking guns. Beyond that, everything, there is a preponderance of other evidence that feeds those. We hear a lot about the laws of physics being violated if you believe the official story on 9-11. But we don't talk much about the laws of thermodynamics. And the same is true that if you believe the official story, then you must believe that the laws of thermodynamics were also violated. The second law of thermodynamics says that heat will always move from the hotter region to the colder region. And what that means is that you cannot get, heat will not migrate towards itself and create a concentration of heat, a concentration of much hotter zones. So therefore, for you to have molten metal in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, in that, that, that molten metal pouring out of the side of the tower, for you to have gotten that material, you had to start with a much, much hotter heat source, such as you would get with an incendiary, for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the, the steel, melt the iron, to get these iron, these spheres, these molten spheres. It's very important to understand that heat cannot move towards itself. Heat will not move towards itself to create hotter pockets. It will only move away from itself. It will only tend towards cooling. So therefore, your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, with that 4,500 degrees, as that heat moves away from itself, there's still enough heat left to do the work of melting the iron.